Trump has worked its way into a huge like amount of case evidence against the sheriff's department that they really do profile people and this is how many times have we seen them stop and this is the probable likelihood of someone who's non-white driving and getting stopped you know it's really high and the justice department said it was wrong and came here and gave a big report about it but they haven't done anything i mean nobody's done anything really. so we're back, back to us again and the people who film because that's all we have right now is the right to film and like I said, we're not there to film the perpetrator, we're there to film the police, so we're not gathering evidence for them. We're gathering evidence in case they do something, or that person wants to sue later because they got beat up or something like that. I've never seen anybody get beat up on camera. I, I, that's not entirely true, though. During a protest recently, they did, they did rough up some people on camera in front of us, and we got it, and it's like, you know, gonna be used eventually. Because <clears throat> this evidence is, is it's evidence of criminal wrongdoing, but really it's just a settlement offer that comes at some point. One of my friends, Christy, made $60,000 because they arrested her for clapping at the county supervisor's office. Well, it was actually inside the, the meeting, and then she also got arrested in the supervisor's office. So there's like two different arrests. But she eventually made $60,000 for these illegal arrests because you have the right to petition the people who govern, supposedly, and you have the right to give freedom of speech to give talks. And she was in a, a situation where there, there's an expectation of public right to, to talk. And they clap for other things during the meeting. They just didn't want clapping from these people at that time. So there was a little bit of, of infringement of rights or something like that. And that's what they were able to get. She didn't get roughed up or anything like that. She wasn't a police abuse moment. But the, the point is, is that with evidence, you can go forward. Uh, the people that were roughed up at the ALEC protest some of it got on film. I've already posted some of it online. And those are going to eventually turn into probably settlements as they show the video and just be like, look what these people were doing. They were just sitting on the ground. And they took a barricade and they like smashed it down on top of one of the people and then put it down behind them and arrested everybody. But before that, they were like kicking them and stuff. And we got all that on all that. All that. So like I said, sometimes you do catch them on camera, but mostly during a protest situation or some kind of First Amendment rights like this. this. This is a perfect spot. Let's say the police were to come here right now. I've got a camera and I would start filming and I would tell them that I'm filming to stop police brutality or something like that. I would even not say anything at all, but just having the camera pointed at them, they'll act differently. Um, someone whispered to me today that I should tell everyone here to get cameras and film them every time they come to, to the park. It's a good idea. It is. It, it's not always practical because not everybody has a camera to just whip out and start filming. I barely remember to bring mine down here tonight. Um, it's, it's, it's a matter of timing because as soon as you see them, you should get them on camera right away. So you want to you know, let them know they're being filmed and then they'll kind of act differently after that. Because they, 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 in the back of their minds, you know, they want to keep their job or they don't want to make a big settlement for the city or something along those lines. So they know that they have to be a little more behaved. But then again, you've seen them on their own cameras and their own cars beating people up in their cars too. You, you, you watch YouTube videos of it and you can see it. They beat people up all the time on camera in front of their own vehicle. So, and that's being filmed. So, I mean, it's not always possible for them to step out of the limelight before they start walloping people. But this is true from the police level all the way up through the Department of Corrections. Everybody that's in the Department of Corrections beats people up. Um, they use it as a form of like, I don't know, punishment or I don't know what it's used for, but it's actually a criminal thing control. and it's, a, it's against human rights. It's a control thing. A control thing. They're, they're, afraid, they're afraid the prisoners are going you know, to take over because they do have a very strong society in prisons. They're worried that another Sorry, Attica Sorry, I've happen. always used that. The biggest concern for them is Attica. They never, ever, ever want Attica to happen again because the prisoners took control of the prisons. They, they didn't regain it until they did like a full-on attack. And everybody looked bad. Of course, prisoners died, guards died. I mean, there was a huge like death toll. So that they do a lot of techniques even to keep people from getting along in jail. They split everybody up by race. They, they, they make sure that everyone turns against each other. They have the, the gang leaders, they feed them stuff, and then they feed them misinformation, and then they allow them to go beat people up, and they keep a whole system running where everybody's all like this, and they never get together. So Attica can't happen. And then the abuse part of it goes along with that. They have to keep them in line, and so they've got to show people who's the boss. Well, anyway, on the streets, 
they really only are officers of the court. That's the only reason they're present doing what they're doing is because they've been sanctioned by the court to be there. So anything they say is supposedly true because they've already been put into the court officer position. And they're supposed to only be doing something to gather evidence to prepare for a case that's not going to be tried by them. They're just going to hand people over and then hand off the case and hopefully it'll get whatever happens, happens. And the cop watch, what we try to do is we try and capture as much footage as possible of them doing stops with people. And the more that we do that, the more they realize that anyone can do that. And see, that's what another part of cop watch is, is that anyone can do cop watch. Anyone can use a camera. One time we were in San Francisco and the police were chasing these kids after a protest in the street. And so they were going through the neighborhood. And then as we went through the neighborhood, people would come out of their houses with cameras and start filming the police. <clears throat> so they've gotten the message over in the Bay Area of what to do when the police appear. And here, I think people are starting to get it because a lot of cameras come out. But does everyone remember Oscar Grant when he was killed on the platform in the BART station in Oakland? It was on New Year's Eve a few years ago. And there were hundreds of cameras running at that time. They were all trapped inside the train and they had these kids out of the train on the platform and they had him face down. And I guess the guy was reaching for his taser, but instead he grabbed a pistol and he killed him. And that got filmed. And then the police went around and grabbed every single piece of electronic equipment they could get from everybody in all the cars. And still four video shots came out of it. <laughs> so it really pays for every person that has a camera to film because you never know which camera is going to be left after they take them all away. Because that's another aspect of it is that they can take your equipment away. They just seize it. And if you have some proof of that, you get, you get it back. Even at the protest, they seized this one guy's $1,000 camera, and eventually he got that back. He's still trying to get the charges dropped against him, but it's probably going to happen that his charges are going to be dropped eventually. So they did give him his stuff back. But another friend of mine was filming somebody getting beat up at the time, and they, they threw her to the ground, took her camera, never returned it, and charged her. Well, so they released her with the threat of a charge after she'd been held for like 16 hours. So they never really charged her with anything, did not return the camera, and that was like, his court was totally screwed because all her evidence was in that camera. And they knew that. They took it. So, I mean, those are sort of <clears throat> some local incidents, too, of, of how the police interact. But when you start filming, just stand back from them so that you're not in their face and don't talk to them. And just, ta just film. If you do talk, add information in, like, facts like the time of day, what day it is, where you're located, what things are near you. You know, even pan around a little bit to see what the area has in it, too, just to kind of capture all of that as much as anything as possible. And then, you know, use the information however you will. If you want to post it on YouTube, you can post it on YouTube. It usually doesn't matter. These videos, a lot of times, don't result in anything. But that's the great thing about electronics. You can just erase it and recharge it and start over again. And you don't, you don't lose anything. And you're still helping because you're keeping them always looking over their shoulder, thinking, who's filming me? Who's filming me? Because they need to do that. That helps, that helps reduce the amount of brutality by a lot. Um, I can tell you a little more about Cop Watch. It um, has a meeting once a month, and only the members that are trained attend it. And we usually just plan patrols. And, we raised some money for new equipment. We just started a new website. Um, it's phoenixpopwatch.wordpress.com. And I brought some bus cards to hand out tonight. And the website's close to being on there. It's just instead of .org, it's .wordpress.com. And we do some communication with other Copwatch groups in other cities. Uh, we've had a conference together one time, and they've had another one since, but they're decentralized. The, city, the, the cities are autonomous groups and everything, and uh, these little cards are something we hand out when we go out on patrols, and we just give them out as um, PR for people, and it just kind of gives you some like careful advice about what to do when you're stopped. If you're in your home, um, it stresses the most important line, which is, we, you know, I don't consent to searches. Yeah. You know, those are, those are like, can I call my lawyer and I don't consent to searches. Those are probably the two most important statements that you need to offer. Also, am I being detained is a question to ask. 
because if you're not, you're free to go. Um, and that's just if they just stop you on the street or stop your car. Um, there's tricks you can pull. Um, people sometimes when they're stopped in their cars, get out of their cars and lock the cars and put the keys in their pocket um, with the windows shut. And that means you, you have more control over that search. Also, if, you're, if your trunk is locked, it requires a, a warrant to open it. You can force that. Now, there's some exceptions to that, like if they see a seed on the floor or some other kind of weird cop trick. But just as a general rule, you do not have to consent to any search ever. And if there is a warrant, you have to see it. You can't just be told there's one. So if you're in your home, you keep the door locked, you don't open it because they'll push their way in and you just say, you know, is there a warrant? Can you slip it under the door or push it up on the window or something? You have to see your name on the warrant, right? Yeah, you have to see your name on the warrant. And I've had friends that were chased into houses before where everyone locked down and they never got in. And I've done that more than once with the police in protest situations where we locked down, the police tried to um, get into the place we were in and there were helicopters everywhere, but the press was there filming it. And so we were kind of protected by the cameras of the press in that situation. It was in Miami, Florida a while ago. And you, you do have that, that one thing left, which is the camera, that can save your butt from a lot of problems. If, you, if people are all filming, even press people, it helps to make the situation different than it could otherwise have been. And, you know, when you're in your home, you just have to make sure that you, you don't leave anything out that could be seen through the windows, that could be seen as something or another, because uh, they can use that as a reason to go in. And if, you know, when you have open gates, it's easy for them to push past the gate and right into the yard and into the back area. So if you have locked gates and you have a locked front door, you should pretty much not have to worry about any illegal searches. I've told, I can tell stories all night long because they keep coming to my mind. There was one man down here at Occupy whose dad, um, they did an illegal search and he spent years and years and years as a result of it, um, of the stuff they found and the things that they did with it. It all stem from an illegal search. So sometimes it's just best not to. And even if you're in a criminal situation where you might have allegedly done something wrong and they're trying to arrest you, you still have these rights. You can still assert these rights. And the one to remain silent is important because you don't know exactly when they're gonna Mirandize you. If they Mirandize you, they can use that information against you in court later. But before they Mirandize you, they could just pull all kinds of deception. And, um, my friend reported coercion, where they turn one person against another and get them to talk on each other and stuff. That happens so frequently now, it doesn't even, people don't even realize it, but coercion is not legal. If you can prove it, it's an illegal um, form of confession, forced confession, and you can get the confession thrown out. But you have to have witnesses of that. If it's all done inside some room somewhere, it's hard to get a, a witness to that. So if you can get that done outside in front of the camera, then you're all set. What is coercion to get a system? How do you define that? Well, in this situation, they basically told the person if they didn't confess after they were Mirandized, that they would arrest their friend. So they were threatening arrest of a third party to get the first party to do their, to do their confession. And it is a coerced confession. It was done recently to a couple friends of mine. And it just shows you the techniques that they're so well schooled in. You know, that it just happens right away. But if you're trying to remain silent, it's harder for them to execute anything like that because you're not talking until you get a lawyer. Even if my friends had used that advice, they probably wouldn't be as much trouble as they are right now. But both of them did not sit there silently and there was a confession that was coerced. And now the police report doesn't even include the fact that my friend was there about to be arrested. So they just left that out. They didn't even mention it in the police report even though that was how the confession was actually got. So that's techniques, today's techniques by the Phoenix Police Department in the last two weeks. So I'm pretty sure that we've got to do what we can to try and stop them, at least slow it down. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't know when our next training is. We just had a training recently and we did a patrol for Martin Luther King Day, which was pretty cool. There was no um, police brutality there. And it, it, every month we try to have a training day. So if anybody's interested in joining Copwatch, um, just contact us through probably email. If you want to go to the website, it's phoenixcopwatch.wordpress.com.
think you do a lot of work for you. You uh, give us a, a laptop so we can do it 24 7 down here. <laughs> Well, that's true, and there are a lot of police to watch down here, that's for sure. There are arrests out here. Too. Yeah, I know, that's what I'm saying. And, and we've done some patrols down here and found them harassing people, <coughs> bicyclists and other folks. As we patrol, we found them doing that. We'll, we'll guard the laptop. We, we don't have, have any lost, extra we equipment. Didn't lose, they yeah. didn't confiscate the one we had. The guy that loaned it to us said he had to have it back. I mean, oh, good. But it'd be nice if we had a 24-7 document everything for you, man. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, we don't have any extra equipment to loan out to anybody. We only use the equipment among the people in the group. And it, you have to take a training class to become part of the group. And then borrowing the equipment wouldn't probably be such a difficult task. So if, if we have some volunteers, if they we take, your take course, the training, yeah. You will help us get a 24 7 live stream out here? Um, I'm not going to guarantee anything like quid pro quo kind of thing where I'll do this for you and you do this for me. But um, I'm sure that if you take the training class and stuff, you'll meet other people who are interested in doing that same work. And how, many, then, how many people do you think we need to take this class? I don't know. Oh. I just wanted to say something to sure. that uh, I've got several of the Cop 1 trainings and it's very uh, useful even for your own. They recommend when you do these patrols, you go in, uh, in pairs of two, right? At least. Usually there's a note taker, a facilitator, and a uh, camera person. So it's, it's, it's very useful uh, training that, that you can be used to, to uh, document these abuses. And the second part that I really wanted to kind of emphasize is that through the help of Copwatch volunteers uh, during the Arpaio raids or squeeze period, which you mentioned, uh, we were able to gather a, a lot of useful information that was turned into the Department of Justice to push forward the investigation on racial profiling. So it, it was also helpful, um, you know, in that regard. Yeah, we saw a lot of horrendous stuff when we were doing the sweeps. They were being particularly cruel to people. Like, we would see a stop of a white person, and they would be sitting there with their feet up on the dashboard and talking on the cell phone while their cars being whatever. And then we'd see a brown person handcuffed on the, on the curb looking really unhappy. And, you know, those were like two different stops by just racially different people. And yet they were treated entirely differently by the police. And, you know, I'm not kidding you either. That white guy was really doing exactly what I said. I mean, he just looked so relaxed. Like he had nothing to worry about at all. And, you know, the brown people, when they're driving around, have to look over their shoulder because, you know, you could be profiled. And of course, this we I explained earlier why that happens, you know, <laughs> of the slave patrols and all. But um, how, how, how many classes do you have to attend here? It's just a one. It's just one course, three hours, and then we also have a training patrol that you're required to go on before you're considered a member. Is, is there a, a fee? No. Hmm. There is a. If you want to have a shirt, um, we ask for ten dollars. But even then, we might just give you some patches and you can put it on an orange shirt and make it yourself. Because we're pretty much, we're people that try and just do, do stuff, or do a DIY kind of thing. So we're really not trying to force anyone to buy anything or have to really put any bills. And we do benefit shows. So once in a while, we'll throw a show and we'll have some bands and some raffles and some giveaways. And we'll bake sale and we'll raise 600 bucks. And then we'll use that to get another piece of equipment or replace, usually replace stuff that we've lost. So it's, just, it's sort of continuous, but we don't have a live streaming facility yet. We would like to do a Twitter feed and live streaming from Patrol. That's one of our goals, is to start that up. That's why I suggested he go ahead and join us and see who else is interested in that project, because they might find that there's already three people interested in doing that with him, and you know they can work on the financing part of it. Is there any other questions I can answer about Hopwatch? Everybody got a bus card? Anybody want extras? Take home for family and members? Other people that could use them? Just pass them around to friends you know. Even if you've read it, just pass it on to somebody else. That way you can pass this information around. And it's pretty good to know. We have them in Spanish and English. The ACLU does a really nice card, too. They have a nice Spanish card. Our stuff's based on the ACLU stuff, too. They're really the ones that do the legal support work for a lot of things. We have a lawyer that joins us, that helps us, and we have a home contact person on every patrol.
so we have a lawyer's number and a phone contact person in case we get arrested. So and those are preparations in case we get arrested. So we do take steps to prepare for it, but none of us, I don't think, have ever been arrested. They have politically targeted people for being in Cop Watch and done things to them because they were in Cop Watch. Maybe they got in trouble for some other reason. They were more, they were more cruel to them because they were in Cop Watch. So they definitely don't like Cop Watch people, but what can they do, really, if we're all in Cop Watch? Does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, are the patrols uh, night or day? Uh, weekend or weekday? Mostly at night and sometimes on the weekends. Like, we try and get when they're trying to, to go after the kids on Mill Avenue or when they're, like, doing the checkpoints for DUI. You know, those little times when they swarm and they put up their command centers and they act all tough and ridiculous. Those are the times to get out and start filming them. <laughs> what else are we going to do? You know, I mean, there's not a lot to do to retaliate from oppression like that. Yeah, when the cop, when the cops come to you with their chest all popped out and they're acting all Mr. Billy Badass. Oh. Act, oh, I've got this, I've got a gun and I, could, I got a badge and I can, uh, I can arrest you and make something up. I know, right? <laughs> Without they do the have camera. To lie a yeah. Lot. That's another thing, they lie a lot. Mm -hmm. oh. And the people that work in the court system, one of the favorite things to do is to watch for a cop to get caught in a lie. Because they're all waiting for it. But, you know, everybody who works there is so bored. It's such a boring place to work. <laughs> and they're just like sitting on the edge of their chair. When the cops like caught in a lie, they're all like. It's like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, where I was living, uh, where I was living in Bisbee, yeah. like, at the end of the month, the cops would be out to fill their quota and they would they would stop people for the most ridiculous things just just ju just to say they got those arrests and in the end well in the end most of the, like most of the arrests I mean even though they probably weren't filmed they ended up getting, ended up getting thrown out anyway so there's also some other dirty they do obviously yeah. that, that can get caught on camera. There's a, there's a, a video of, of an officer here that, uh, you know, because yeah, he, he uh, murdered a youth in, in South Phoenix, they pulled up other videos of him, like maybe five years ago, where he planted some kind of pipe yeah. uh, on, on, a us, on a lady, an old oh. lady uh, that was just walking down the street. It was caught by like a uh, medical place. Uh, places camera and, and they used to, to show that you know, this, police, <laughs> this police officer oh, intentionally, <laughs> intentionally planted like this attack pipe and they were, it was bad because they're trying to uh, joke around or, or make fun of this uh, maybe med medical uh, Did they end up killing disabled. somebody later Christmas? Yeah, that was uh, Danny Rodriguez a youth and His um, so trial's coming up in June we're all looking forward to the final day of his trial. This man killed somebody a year and a half ago and has yet to go on trial as a police officer. And we protested. We were out in front of the police station protesting. It was horrible. And I know they kill people all the time. And that's one of the things on the top five list is, you know, taser, kill. You know, I mean, they don't always do it in the same order either. And they just pick one of them and they go with taser, kill. And you can really use that ego of theirs. To, uh, you can stroke it and make them feel good and they like you. <laughs> I've done that. I cracked a joke and then I realized that one of the cops cracked a joke too and I realized, wow, I guess we're making some bond here. <laughs> and it turned into my favor as he started making fun of the officer that was leading the whole investigation. He was actually cracking jokes about it. <laughs> and, it, it really, and it all started from him, me saying, you have the gun and him saying, yeah, I can put it to your head and blow you away. And someone behind me is like, oh, that's not nice. <laughs> and then from there, it just kind of broke down. Like, I had stroked his ego. That was all he needed to have me recognize him as the, the, the one with the gun, you know? And it, it was enough for him to turn and become, like, favorable towards us. So it was it was not what I was expecting. I was just responding to something he said, and I was like, well, you do have the gun, you know? Like, you know, nobody else is armed. <laughs> you're, the, you know, you're the ones that are dangerous. But I didn't say that. That's what I usually end up telling them, though, because I mean, they're the most harrowing experience to encounter is the police. We don't end up regularly walking around with each other. We don't cuff and you know throw each other to the ground and you know <laughs> unless we're mugging or something. I mean, we're not doing that to each other. But the police are doing it all the time to us. 
to them, that's just a regular everyday occurrence to pat somebody down or, you know, throw them up against a wall or make them feel uncomfortable or, you know, just treat them badly and just, and, and not give them their dignity and really and, and their human rights, which we all are entitled to. And that's kind of what we're resting upon is that there's a, there's a base of human rights that people are, are given and it's just for being here, not because you signed up for it. But, you know, it's hard for people to recognize those. That, that, you know, what are the, some of those rights? What do people feel are some of those basic human rights? The right to exist. To test the legality of your detention, habeas corpus, which is from the Magna Carta. And we just recently lost it with the last defense authorization bill. They can now hold us in, indefinitely without trial for 10 plus years, forever. And so we lost habeas corpus recently. That's what happened over Christmas. That was their gift to us, was formalizing the loss of habeas corpus. And now the military can take any of us into custody and not have a trial like Bradley Manning or whatever and hold us forever and never, ever have a trial. We don't have the right to test the legality of our detention over and over again like we used to. So that right, it's still present. We still have the right to do it, but that doesn't mean they're going to recognize it. What other rights, what other basic human rights do we have? <laughs> Are there some human rights that we want to have? Medical care. <laughs> yeah. Equal marriage? Yeah. Yeah, basic rights to, to associate, mutually associate, and the freedom not to associate. Those are basic human rights. The basic human right of giving aid to people. I right, love you guys. Want to give aid. Hey, guys. Okay, you guys. Later. Fun. You got it, bro. Let's get a camera shot, bro. You going to control? <laughs> I guess y'all the Redwoods. Yeah, I see you, man. <laughs> the Redwoods. The legality of your detention. Over and over and over and over. Because all along the way, the more challenges you have, the better chance you have of being let off because you might be innocent and you deserve to be let off. And so the right to challenge the legality of your detention is basic human right. I was going to propose a new one, which is the right to oblivion. And this is in the electronic age. It has something to do with Jack! So there's this new idea coming out of Argentina and France, and it, I forgot the French term for it, but it's called the right to oblivion, and it's the right to erase any picture that's been taken of you in your past. If you don't want to have it on the internet anymore, you have the right to remove that picture. If someone owns a picture of you, you have the right to have it, and you have the right to never have that picture shown again. It's, it's the right to oblivion, and it's not something that most people recognize yet. It's only being talked about in Argentina and in France right now, but it's a basic human right in the age of electronics. Do you know what Facebook is getting ready to do? They're going to put the live cameras that are they can get on the internet that are already streaming, and they're going to feed them all together, and then they're going to use face recognition software and match it to your Facebook profile, and it will start following you using face recognition on cameras on the streets or wherever the cameras are. Oh, my God. And so in the next few years, Facebook is going to have this, this face recognition thing going on these cameras as we walk down the street. That's their plan. That's the next step. Why? Take your pictures down, that's all. It's just, it's just like that GPS locating thing they have on pictures now. If you shoot a picture with one of these little smart cameras, it, it stamps it with a GPS location. So that, that picture, whenever it's brought up on the internet, it reads it and then it can put in the location right below the picture. So it's the same idea. But then Creepy. this is going further. <laughs> it's going sometimes further. Sometimes we like it. Sometimes we don't. <laughs> yeah, some people probably think it's cool to have their face recognized everywhere they go, and they, they can see it on their Facebook profile or everywhere they went. Not always some a good people, thing. not so much. It's yeah. not always yeah. a good thing. Not so much. But that's one of the reasons why I'm encouraging the right of oblivion as another basic human right is to be able to remove our pictures anytime they're present and never have them shown again. That is something that as a person we should have that right to our image and the ability to, to get rid of it, no matter how famous we are or whatever, because you can just picture people doing things when they're younger and then getting older and being like, I don't want those pictures shown anymore. For whatever reason, I'm not there and now I'm here. I don't want those old pictures. So if we have the right to oblivion, we can get rid of those pictures because we own the image of ourselves and no one can ever take that away from us. Oh, serious? This is like a big challenge to this notion of, uh, of that privacy is no more. Yeah, there's no expectation of privacy in a space like this. And anywhere that's really not inside your home, you don't have an expectation of privacy. And the police don't either. Like, they don't have a right either to privacy. 
and so you can film them. There is a little bit of a technicality in some states with wiretapping, where you could film them, but you're, you're using audio to record as well. That could possibly be an illegal um, act of audio recording because of those wiretapping laws and the way they're set up. So there is some of that to worry about, but most of the police here don't seem to care about that. They're more about intimidating you if you start filming at all. Yeah, they were very unhappy with us filming, doing much filming over here. Right. I'll they bet. would, they would, what they would do, they would set in their car and flash their uh, flash the lights. They bright light. The old know, bright light trick. Oh, beam yeah. right at, at oh, you. Yeah. But some cameras are really good at filtering out bright lights. If you have a good camera, it just tones down that area on yeah. the picture and it continues to film all around it. <laughs> and even my high def camera looks like it's being blocked out, but when you go in and look at the picture, you can see everything. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't stop it, but that is an old, old trick <laughs> that they use on every single camera they can find. And if the, in this area here, you just everybody should be loaded up and ready to go. And as soon as they appear, just you know, pretend to film. Do them. you have Twitter? Or even, um, you even Scott that, they would. Uh, it isn't yet. They would. It will be. Yeah, like around around the area where the uh, person was being arrested or detained or whatever the case may be, the cops would the cops would block it around so they like so they could couldn't get a clear picture. So they could do whatever in the yeah. middle of that circle. Yeah. yeah. It's true. And they do a lot of like stress stuff where they grind bones into the ground. Like, yeah. I'm told they do ankles especially and yeah. other places that you know are hard to to locate. Knee to the back of the neck. <laughs> but then this one dude got pulled into the sheriff's station when they were blockading the doorway and he just got his ass kicked. They just caught him. He had bruises on his back. He had, I mean, they really, really, they had to send him to the hospital, I think. Wow. And then he came out and showed us all his bruises and then they dropped the charges soon after. <laughs> so <clears throat> that's how it usually goes yep. after they pull a stunt like that because they don't want to get themselves any more trouble. Even the people they arrested for Alec, I noticed they never put their pictures up on the sheriff's website. They never did the mugshot thing with them because they could have had their picture used in the mugshot way and then yeah. that could be used against them later Ugh. for more liable and more settlement. Yep. And, and so they, they haven't put any of the arrests they've done down here up on those any, websites yeah. the same at all. Reason, the for the same reason, they're really trying to hold down the liability of these arrests. And the mugshot thing is another way for you to get money because if you're found innocent and your mugshot's already circulated and people used it, you could go after them for that too. So they've stopped releasing mugshots of people they think are not are, are liable to go after them. So I just thought that was a little interesting tidbit on the whole thing, but I'm pretty much done. Could I have another question about uh, uh, the the cops when when uh, when they're in a car, do they use microphones like like shotgun mics or anything to to uh, listen in on other people's conversations? Well, okay, that's interesting. They use a system called Viper that does um, cell phone ID. So any cell phone in the area, it IDs it and uses the GPS locator to figure out where the cell phone is. And so they know who people are by their cell phones, just transmitting their, their GPS and their cell phone IDs. And the Viper system matches that up with, with records from the telephone companies. So they have those installed, some of the cruisers, not all of them. So there's that. Now listening in part of it, like a boom mic type of thing, yeah. um, I don't think there's that much specialized equipment, really. They did get a bunch more money, so maybe they did get some more specialized equipment. But they have to really be set up for surveillance to do that. They normally don't go around surveilling people like that. Like it would have to be a particular action or whatever that they're looking at in order to start all that kind of stuff up. They probably do use it, but I would expect to see more of the FBI type folks use it and stuff like that than the Phoenix Police Department. Or the sheriffs. Yeah, and we thought they were really surveilling us for the ALEC event because we really thought we were going to be pre-rated and a lot of other stuff was going to happen. And we were completely off the radar. They really weren't following us at all like we thought they would. And you know, maybe in the future they will, but at least the, we were over cautious. We were overly cautious and we realized afterwards that we really weren't being watched at all. How do you know you weren't being watched? Just by the way they acted and stuff, and the way they didn't weren't able to penetrate what we were doing. So when we texted everybody and said, go to SRP that morning, they showed up to SRP and the police didn't have, didn't have a clue. 
they didn't know where we were going. They didn't know what was going to happen. They thought Occupy people went back to Alec up in Scottsdale. Yeah, I went there and I said, where is everybody? But that served a purpose because it kept them busy up in Scottsdale. The riot cops didn't show up to SRP for three hours because they were so like, what do we do now? And SRP lockdown was over by then. They were walking yeah, away yeah. from it. So it was really not a problem and it worked out beautifully. So we thought they were more into the whole thing that you're talking about and we they didn't get they didn't have that set up. We weren't being followed as much as we thought they could be. they could have followed us a lot more than they did. And they just never did. So I'm I'm heartened at least knowing they're not that brilliant. <laughs> at least not yet. We're not facing that.